Hi, this is Dark Journalist. Today we have the exciting part two episode with remote viewing pioneer, physicist Russell Targ. Now, Russell's fascinating work developing a covert team of psychic spies is the subject of a forthcoming documentary film called Third Eye Spies that's due to come out later this year. Now, in part one, Russell described the major cases that the legendary group of remote viewers tackled for the covert national security state. In this episode, we'll find out how to do remote viewing and show how there are many aspects of psychic vision. Are we ready to look at things through a fascinating new lens? Here we go. Physicist Russell Targ, Psychic Breakthrough, Remote Viewing the Future. Psychic functioning is a non-analytic ability. Separation is an illusion. That consciousness is a singular of which there is no plural. Remote viewing is non-local in that the future can affect you at the present time. That evidence is really very strong, and that's why CIA supported us for two decades. You know, there are many aspects of psychic phenomena that have been virtually ignored by mainstream psychology and science, not due to lack of evidence, but because it falls outside of their information comfort zone. In many cultures, from India to South America, paranormal abilities, ESP, contact with ancestors, and advanced forms of telepathy are celebrated as great gifts. But the cult of experts that infiltrate and run our academic institutions in the media have let their arrogance black out alternative possibilities. What's the real story? Let's go ask physicist Russell Targ. Dark journalist will go there. The deepest issues, the hardest stories, the biggest secrets. The truth is never easy. With top guests, like former Assistant Housing Secretary Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine, who is really behind this media censorship? And internet feeds go through satellites. Who controls the satellites? It's the Pentagon. Legendary investigator Graham Hancock. Now, Graham, this cataclysm must have destroyed an advanced culture in our ancient past. Uh, it truly was an extinction level event. It was accompanied by massive animal extinctions. It was accompanied by huge and unexplained sea level rises and then a sudden plunge of global temperatures. Best selling author Jim Mars. Jim, don't these elite corporate owners need us around to buy their GMO food? Why would they want to depopulate? because they are eugenicists and they believe that they need to purify the human race. And if that sounds like the Nazis, that's exactly what it is. Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, how are we going to scale that wall of UFO secrecy? Humans themselves are bypassing, are beginning to dismiss all of the policies of denial and lies. Dark journalists will go there. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special summer discount available for just $39 for one full year. You'll not only receive access to the complete audio archives to stream or download at your convenience, you'll also get exclusive subscriber-only content and Dark Journalist event discounts. Sign up for our free newsletter to stay updated on the latest shows. Dark Journalist. Let's get the real story in 2016. You know, we need Dark Journalists, so just keep doing what you're doing. Well, hello everyone. I really love starting off September with part two of this special interview with Russell Targ while the media is running around trying to keep us focused on their script of the presidential hunger games. It's important to remember that we have these deeper abilities and can really discern the kind of brainwashing and entrainment that they have to offer. Someone like our guest today can really teach us about these unique psychic abilities and now we all get to be his students. Uh, for a little while. A quick reminder here to go to darkjournalist.com to subscribe to our newsletter so you don't miss any of the exciting shows we have coming up for you this fall. Russell, it's great to have you back for part two on remote viewing and your new movie, Third Eye Spies. Now, we covered a lot of what you did at Stanford Research Institute, developing this incredible team of legendary remote viewers uh, and the top secret work you were able to do with them for these covert intelligence agencies. That's right. What I'd like to start out with in this episode is what the process of remote viewing is all about. For example, uh, could we say that someone like Edgar Cayce, who was the greatest psychic of the 20th century, 
would we say that he was a remote viewer and that he was doing remote viewing when he would go into trance and diagnose someone at a distance and also uh, see events at a distance? Uh, you could certainly call that uh, remote viewing. I, I would probably not do that. I would call it intuitive diagnosis uh -huh. because uh, when I do a workshop, for example, I will do, unless I'm doing a weekend workshop, I will end with uh, an intuitive diagnosis experiment where each of the people who team up as pairs, each person will have written down the name of a person together with a few of his general properties, height, sex, what's he interested in, uh, what what are his medical medical problems? Few four or five lines, and then he'll just put that on the desk face down, and have his partner try and describe uh, what he can about the man on the card or woman on the card. That works excellently. That kind of, is ostensibly a telepathy experiment, except that the viewer sometimes describe things about the person uh, which aren't known to the man with the card. When I was learning to do intuitive diagnosis, one of the first things I described uh, was a woman. I described a uh, smallish woman with dark curly hair, and there's something the matter with her shoulder. I see uh, electrical sparks going back and forth in her shoulder, and I can't tell what that's all about. I, uh, from my study of anatomy and physiology that I did before I started this class, I didn't know anything about sparks in the shoulder, and my teacher didn't either. This is a double-blind experiment. Okay. So she called her friend, who was a tennis player, and the tennis player had recently had a metal implant because of a shoulder separation. Hmm. So I apparently saw the electrical currents associated with this uh, metal, metal uh, implant that she had because the person that I was working with didn't know anything about it. Wow. There, there, was, there was no no sensory leakage, no telepathy. So that would be an instance where I got information. I was her, All they had in a card was her name. Yeah, the, the, there were a number of envelopes, and we just picked it up, picked a blank envelope, and the tennis player was residing in the envelope. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing my remote viewing intuitive diagnosis, neither I nor my teacher knew who I had in the envelope. So she opened it and said, "Oh, there's Margaret. I have no idea what these arcs and sparks could be. I'll call her up." Well, that's an intriguing process right there. So uh, so intuitive diagnosis is psychic functioning. It's not exactly um, remote viewing. When I start somebody in a remote viewing trial, I, I, I could say to you, if you were going to do a remote viewing with me, uh, I've just picked up an interesting object on my desk. Right. Uh, quite an interesting object. I wouldn't say, what do you think I have? I would say, close your eyes and describe the surprising image. Describe the surprising image that comes into your awareness. What well, what suddenly pops into your awareness that wasn't there before? Yeah, I see. I see. So, so should I try to respond to that? Yeah, you could respond if you want. Well, uh, I see George Washington. Well, I would say, uh, tell, tell me about the image that makes you think of that. Well, I was seeing a circle, and uh, I figure it's a quarter, and then I thought, George Washington. Tell me, uh, tell me about the quarter. The, the what I want you to do is, I want you to back away from the analysis. Okay. You are describing my object. I just want you to tell me the, about the image. Let's see, we, we've got, we, we, we started with George Washington. 
who is a straight up analytical take. And then you said, uh, well, it was actually a quarter that I saw. Now, can you tell me about the image? And then I'll tell you what I had. Yes. Well, I saw something that looked like the face of George Washington. And then I figured it was a quarter. And I noticed the face had a kind of raised quality to it. So I was thinking it's George Washington. And it was basically a kind of face in a circle. That's excellent. That if we were on a, on a scale of of seven, we would give you a five and say you have unique magical elements with some noise. I see. And we we would we would we would buy silver based on that. So what I have in my hand is a very nice three inch diameter magnifying glass. So I have a. Circular magnifying glass. I'm in a pretty dark room, except for an overhead lamp. Yes. So I have the circular magnifying glass, uh, which is brightly illuminated because it's a magnifier. So I'm sitting in this dark room, and I got this shiny, bright magnifier in my hand uh. with a dark rim around it. Uh, I don't have George Washington in my glass but I have the distorted image of all the stuff on my desk. Oh, right, right. So if you had drawn that, what you would do is you would, uh, you would have drawn the circle uh -huh. with a rim around it, which is exactly what I have in my hand. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Isn't that easy? Wow, that is really fascinating. And I can see how, after doing it, that would just come naturally to get to that pure image. I mean, I have, I have all sorts of other junk on my desk that I could have picked up. Definitely. Which is, in a certain sense, could have been more interesting. I just took the thing. I, I, I didn't want to take some... I have this magnifying glass sitting right in front of me, so I didn't want to have the experience of saying, no magnifying glass, I'll pick up some other thing. Yes. So I didn't want to... I wanted to keep it clean. Absolutely. I see what you mean. Well, it's a very interesting and subtle difference when you go from seeing something circular to projecting a quarter to projecting George Washington. That's right. <laughs> that, that's why we do this with, a, with an interviewer. Uh -huh. in, the, in all the work we did for SRI, I never knew the answer. That I, I was a blind interviewer. Interesting. No, no reference to my bad vision. Yeah. I, was just, I, I just never knew what the answer was. Right. So if I'm into, and this occurred in one of our published experiments, a guy said, well, I think my car, I think that put off has gone to Macy's. And that doesn't sound, in my experience, that doesn't sound like remote viewing. So I said, don't tell me about Macy's. Let's start over. Just tell me about the surprising images that popped up in your head that made you see Macy's. And I said, well, I thought of Macy's because I saw a whole row of coat hangers. I said, let's forget the coat hangers. Can you just tell me what you're actually seeing? And he said, well, I see a array of triangles, one behind the other, many, many triangles all in a row. And I said, would you draw that? And where Hal was at a pedestrian overpass with a wire enclosure so people won't jump into the highway. <laughs> and what was on the overpass was a whole concatenation of wire triangles making up the top of the thing. Oh. So what he drew was a very, very good illustration of what was there. It was an excellent drawing of what was there. But I had to help him get from Macy's to the experience he was having. I see. So he had the ability to do remote viewing for sure, but he had this kind of associative imagery around what he was seeing. For, so for your listeners, that gives a good idea of what we mean by saying the psychic functioning is a non-analytic ability. That you come on with George Washington and it's been my job to help you uh, get away from George Washington to the image you actually had 
before you made it into George Washington. Right, exactly. So that's what I did for a living for a decade. So I the unusual situation of the CIA uh, paid my salary for 10 years to sit in the dark and develop my um, spiritual uh, way of life. So, so the first time that anybody ever paid this... The first time the CIA ever paid anyone to develop a spiritual practice. <laughs> that really is an excellent point. And I think it's powerful that you were feeding uh, them these results from the program and that they were getting this kind of inspired and unique feedback. Now, uh, one of the terms you developed along the way that I think says so much about this fascinating work, the term is non-local mind. So can you elaborate on that uh, for us here? Well, modern, modern physics, uh, Schrodinger is one of those who said that separation is an illusion, that consciousness is a singular of which there is no plural. And what he had in mind is that our, our conscious, there's only one consciousness, many bodies, one consciousness. And this is an idea that the Buddhists told that in the early Buddhist writing in the Prajnaparamita, first writings of Buddhism, uh, they say again and again that separation is an illusion. Right. Now, non-locality is considered one of the most important ideas in modern physics. So modern physics has finally caught up with the Buddhists. And what they say is that when particles are created together, like twins, where you have a pair of photons or a pair of electrons created together in a physics reaction, and they go off in opposite directions, the speed of light. So what you have right now is uh, two particles being, let, let's say you have a high-energy photon going into a crystal, and what comes out of that is two lower-energy photons. So you you are... Uh, uh, a green one coming in, and then you get two red ones coming out. So you got these two red ones coming out at an angle from each other. And those they have energy and they have a polarization. So what they observe is that if you grab one of those photons and measure its polarization, that can affect the polarization of the other one. Even though that would be considered impossible because Einstein's Special theory of relativity is that you can't communicate between things that are traveling away from each other at the speed of light. Huh. This uh, non-locality shows that things that are separated from one another are connected. An example would be if you have two tuning forks in a laboratory and they're both tuned to uh, middle C and you strike one of the tuning forks, even though the other one's across the room, the other one will begin to ring at middle C because they're uh, resonant to the same frequency, and they're and physicists would say they're very high Q devices. That is, the, the only frequency at which they can resonate is middle C. So all the energy that comes into it makes it resonate at middle C. So when you strike one of them at middle C, then the other one will vibrate at the same frequency, uh -huh. even though they're separated from one another. Now, they're communicating at the speed of light, so it's not a physics miracle. It's not, not, it's not, not forbidden. Um, but if you did one of those uh, miles away, as they are now, that would be very surprising. So non-locality talks about the uh, coincidental appearance of information in one system that's far removed from another system. And this was predicted by Schrodinger. Schrodinger is the first person to talk about uh, uh, not non-locality. He has another common word. Entanglement. Yes. So Schrodinger was the first, uh, first one to talk about entanglement in the 1930s. 
Then 1935, Einstein wrote a paper with two other people, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Now, it had been described as the EPR paradox. Einstein said, quantum mechanics predicts that you have this entanglement between photons, and that's forbidden by relativity theory, which works very well, thank you. <laughs> and then it was uh, 25 years later uh, that it was proven uh, that this uh, that that's the way the world works. So that was a real breakthrough. Uh, John Bell wrote a paper showing that John Bell, the first one to talk about non-locality, John Stuart Bell, in the 60s, and then 1970 at Berkeley, the first experiment was done showing that non-locality is real. So there's really more to the universe than we think. And basically, what we discover from the remote viewing is that there's more to us than we think. There's um, suffering comes from the idea that if you look in the mirror and think that who you are is what you see in the mirror, especially you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, say, holy shit, is that who I really am? And the answer is no, that's not who you are. That's just a reflection of your physical image. Uh -huh. Who you are is really some sort of timeless awareness where your awareness transcends space and time and allows you to communicate with people in the far distance. And the evidence of survival of bodily death is also pretty good. Now, that is a type of research that seems to be growing a lot now. Would you say that that has any relation to the more psychic-style work that you were doing in the program? Uh, that's not part of remote viewing. Okay. Just a uh, hundred years of evidence of uh, information coming from deceased people, that information is pretty good. Right. That, that, that some aspect of personality survives. And it's interesting, there's increasing interest in that now. Absolutely, no question. That doesn't pertain to uh, remote viewing, but it indicates that uh, we live in a more complex world than uh, had been thought of hitherto. Well, let's tie something in with that. Now, you wrote something very intriguing in your autobiography about dreams and how dreams can be prophetic. Now, what kind of mechanism is it that's operating there, consciousness, astral, or otherwise? If someone dreams of something that actually happens a few days later, what does that tell us? Well, the prophetic dreams are easier to describe than the survival of deceased awareness. The right. prophetic dream, uh, if we believe in precognition, for example, one of the famous experiments we did after I left SRI is forecasting change in the silver commodity future. Uh -huh. And we did nine, nine forecasts like that where the silver would go up and down or whether it would go up and down a little or a lot and all nine forecasts were correct. And this was uh, all well recorded. Uh, we published it, it was, appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Nova made a film about us. So we did nine forecasts, one a week, and they were all correct. And we made $120,000. That's amazing. So in each of these cases, somebody had to describe what object we would show them the following week. So the broker had four objects sitting on his table. One of them was called up a little, one is up a lot, the other down a little, down a lot, and that's it. He had these four objects. So I would sit with my psychic and say, John's got four objects on his desk. I don't know anything about them. Tell me what I'm going to show you next Monday. And the guy would say, well, I see something that looks like a glass cylinder. It smells like perfume, to keep it short. So I would call John and say, well, what have you got this week? And he'd say, well, I've got a bagel. I've got a coffee cup. I've got a, um, a flower. And I've got a perfume cylinder from an airplane, little glass cylinder with perfume in it. 
I said, well, my guy said he smells perfume and he had this glass cylinder. I think that's the right answer. What does that mean? He said, well, that means down a lot. So based on the fact that the guy in Palo Alto smelled a perfume cylinder, we would sell silver. Huh. You got it? Yeah, that's incredible. And he would then get feedback a week later. <clears throat> so the evidence, our evidence that the future can affect you at the present time, that evidence is really very strong. And there's now a whole industry of people doing that exact thing. Right. The the organization, International IRVA, International Remote Viewing Association, uh, has people who are forecasting silver, forecasting sporting events, working with the police. It's all, all, these are a couple hundred people all doing applied remote viewing, generally forecasting the future. Now, if you have a dream from the future, let's say you have a dream that an elephant is walking through your garden. Okay. You wake up and you tell your partner, I have this crazy dream. Uh, here, here I am in uh, Westchester, and I've never had a elephant. I've never seen an elephant in this whole town. And then your partner says, well, if you look out the window... There's an elephant walking right down the street here, right in front of the house, and it turns out that elephant broke away from the circus and setting up a tent uh, in the parking lot. <laughs> so we would say that Monday morning's elephant was the cause of Sunday night's dream. Oh, that really makes sense, yeah. If we live in a non-local world, then things in the future can affect you at an earlier time. Yes. And the most important thing that we observed that we say that remote viewing is uh, a non-local phenomena where we mean that the accuracy and reliability of remote viewing is independent of how far away it is and whether it's in the future or contemporaneous definitely work done in princeton where they did four, 450 remote viewing experiments they showed Absolutely, it was, it was odds of a billion to one that it's no harder to describe what you're going to see tomorrow than what's going on right now. Doing, doing the experiment, giving you feedback the next day for an experiment done the next day works exactly as well as a contemporaneous experiment. So we say re remote viewing is non-local in that it's no harder to see in the distance no harder to see what's going on in Russia than it is to see what's going on across the street. And that's why CIA supported us for two decades. Well, that is fascinating. It's the psychic breakthrough right into the scientific study and the implications of this discovery of non-local consciousness giving us the ability to perceive events in the future is absolutely stunning. And when we come back, I'm going to ask you how we use the same process to look back in time and witness key historical events. And is that even possible? We're getting in deep here. Final round with physicist Russell Targ. I'll be playing the exciting trailer to his new documentary movie, uh, Third Eye Spies. So stay with us. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Subscribe now and you'll have access to the complete audio archives to download or stream at your convenience. Receive advanced updates and discounts on Dark Journalist events. Enjoy exclusive subscriber-only content. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special summer discount. Available for just $39 for one full year. Dark Journalist. The truth is never easy. sitting there filming a little saucer came from uh, I say little saucer it was a saucer came flying over their heads put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed and they picked up their cameras and started over toward it filming as they went and when they got in fairly close to it it lifted up put the gear back in the wheel wells tipped up and took off at a great rate of speed
dark journalist will go there. The cult of experts that infiltrate and run our academic institutions in the media have let their arrogance black out alternative possibilities. Hidden technology. So in other words, the possibility exists that you have here a machine that is manipulating magnetic fields on a planetary scale that has nothing to do with particle physics. The black budget. But there's no such thing as getting away from the corruption because it, it is literally, it is now integrated into every economy in the globe. Geoengineering. I'm talking about right down to the DNA level. Imagine that you have now the microprocessors and sensors along with everything else into every human body. For more deep interviews, special reports, and documentaries, visit darkjournalist.com today. Dark Journalist, the truth is never easy. And we are back. This is Dark Journalist, and I'm speaking with remote viewing pioneer physicist Russell Targ who kick-started the Psychic Spies program at Stanford Research Institute with fellow physicist Hal Putoff. And when their work was declassified, it sent shockwaves everywhere because, of course, the possibility of ESP and telepathy was supposed to be just a fantasy. But year after year, they proved it was true. And not only that, but that the government funded a program to study it. So Russell's fascinating history is now being told in the upcoming movie, Third Eye Spies, coming out in a few months here, but I have the exclusive trailer, and so let's watch this and come back and talk with Russell. My name is Russell Targ, and I'm a physicist. For more than 20 years, the CIA used psychic abilities operationally and in a top secret program for the U.S. government. I helped develop those programs. You paid for them. You deserve to see them. I think that anybody who says we haven't proven it yet hasn't really looked at the data. You can actually take out of thin air information about something you have absolutely no access to. A huge trove of material was declassified by the CIA. I wanted to have a chance to talk to all the different people that we had worked with in the remote viewing program. I haven't been on a road trip like this for many years, so this is really the first time that the people who were cognizant of secret material can talk about it. Would you help us with this case? She's been kidnapped. The subject was going to be finding Patty Hearst. In Pat Price's drawings, it was as if it was from inside his brain. We were then descended upon by all the law enforcement of the United States. And the reward we got is the CIA hired Price away from us. Four months after joining the CIA, Price was dead. And I began to feel frightened. This stuff's real. The more you hide something, the more it shines like a beacon in psychic space. Wow, it really looks like a whirlwind effort. And if anyone wants to stay on top of the release date for this, just keep your eye on Russell's site, ESPResearch.com. And there's going to be a lot more details there. We'll definitely have uh, you back on, Russell, when that comes out. Now, this question uh, we were talking about of remote viewing the future, uh, you know, you've pretty much settled that. There is evidence from your work now and from the experiments of making this over $100,000 in the silver market. So that's pretty much a done deal. How do you feel about remote viewing that looks back at the past, that goes the other way? And, you know, this using this as a way to solve some classic cases like the JFK assassination, for example. Have you been involved in projects that attempted to solve something from the past? How do you feel about remote viewing being used this way? Have you wanted to look at past events? No, I have not wanted to do past experiments because it's very hard to verify. See, if I tell you something about the JFK assassination, uh, we don't know uh, whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. So let's say you do the experiment and you find out uh, that really there were a whole group of people from the mafia who were involved. We can prove that. We don't know where that information came from because you could ask me, 
can you look into the future and see what new information we get about the Kennedy assassination? And I say, well, I see a newspaper, uh, front page of the newspaper, they're talking about the mafia and the Kennedy assassination. So I, I can, I can look back 30 years at the Kennedy assassination or I can look forward into tomorrow's New York Times and we can't tell where it is. So as a scientist, uh, doing experiments, where you simply have a past event, um, you can describe it. Stephen Schwartz is very interested in psychic archaeology, but it's very hard to tell where the information came from. I see. In, in my book, In the Reality of ESP, I describe uh, contemporaneous imp- experiments, what we know now, uh, how you can learn to get in touch with your own psychic ability, and how you can work with a partner to develop your psychic ability. Yes, and that book is very detailed with the experiments you've done, and it's got the methods in there for developing this. That's what I really like, uh, this aspect of the work that you do. You know, the psychic life, it's not a spectator sport. So, you know, people have these innate qualities, and your experience can really give them that confidence to try and go a little bit deeper. Now, one of the interesting uh, synchronicities in your work is that On the one hand, you can study remote viewing as a physicist, but you're also familiar uh, with this esoteric concept of the Akashic Record. Yes. So my question would be, have you decided that this is in fact the same thing? I would say it is the same thing. As uh, uh, Patanjali, who is a Hindu several hundred years before Christ, uh, in in his... um, famous book, which now call How to Know God, but it's not, that's not what he called it, of course, but in the Rise of Patanjali, he talks about the Akashic Records, which is the, and it's a uh, Hindu idea of that time. It's the, the records of everything that has ever happened, ever will happen. Those records, uh, we don't know where they are, but we know that they're available to your consciousness. So it's a, when you do a remote viewing of the future or of the past, it's as though you're going to the galactic library to try and find the information. Right, right, absolutely. So the Akashic Records is a valid model for what we're doing. Okay, yeah, I can really see that correlation and this idea of information being there as a resource, and we discover the means to tap that source of incredible uh, knowledge. Just amazing. Now, Russell, my last question for you, since you know so much on the esoteric side, as well as the scientific, um, what is the difference between remote viewing and what's called an out-of-body experience? Well, remote viewing is a quiet experience you have. For example, in the laboratory, uh, we never want anyone to have a bad experience because Hal and I are just physicists. Uh, we don't want anyone to freak out at the end of the experiment, end of our program. Uh-huh. So we just ask people to quietly describe, tell me what appeared, tell me about the surprising thing, surprising images that show up in your awareness. What are you experiencing? What What's surprising? And nobody ever had a bad experience doing that. Uh, you can, with an experienced viewer, say, uh, let's go to that site. Uh, and uh, I did that once with my friend Hella, who is a great psychic. And we went to the target with Brezhnev's office. And this is Leonid Brezhnev, who was the leader in Russia during the 70s. So we, she said, well, I'm walking down a hallway at the end of the hall to the large red door with a curvy top. It's covered with leather. The leather is held in place with upholstery tacks. And I thought that, that to myself, well, that's very interesting, but that's not actually the answer to the question. So I said, okay, Hella, let, let, I'll just open the door and let's go inside. And she said, yes, but it's dark. I said, all right, let me turn on the lights. 
Now we can see what's going on. And she said, oh, I see a big desk on the right covered with glass. The window's on the left and the door behind the desk. And I said, okay. And of course, I don't know if any of this is true. And I said, let's open the door and we go down the stairs. And I see we're in, in a room with rows of computer bays. And I began to feel frightened about that, that I don't have clearance to be in the computer bays of the Kremlin. So I said, I think we, I think we got enough. Let's get out of here. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Hella. So this would be a kind of out-of-body experience where we are in a distant location, doing stuff, interacting with the environment. And in the back of my mind, if somebody was there, they would probably notice that they had some visitors. <laughs> All right. So that uh, in an out-of-body in an out-of-body experience, you take with you your uh, sensitivity, your imagination, your sexuality, whatever you're comfortable with, and you can have a engaging interaction at a distant space, but you're then vulnerable to having a bad trip. And it was very, very important and in our work at SRI that no one ever go to the management and say, you know, Targ separated my consciousness from my body, and I can't get myself put back together. That would be the end of the program. <laughs> so, uh, out of body experience, out of body experience, and remote viewing are on a continuum. Where, as you commit more and more of your self and your personality and your feelings to the experiment, uh, you can get more and more information but you're more and more vulnerable to scaring yourself. I see. Yes. Well, is this why in remote viewing you're always working with a coordinate? You know, you're working with coordinates around a target? Well, the, the coordinates are just the uh, beacon to get... A co coordinate can give you the same information as asking, where is Joe standing right now? Okay. So you can have an out-of-body experience looking at coordinates just as well as you can looking for a person. It depends how much of your personality and feelings you want to commit to this experiment. Do you want to go to this place? Uh-huh. Oh, I get it. We once did a remote viewing with Ingo, and it turned out the coordinates were an active volcano in Iceland. <laughs> oh, no. And Ingo got very angry that we would send him to such a disagreeable, dangerous place. I can appreciate that. So I began to feel sick from the fumes. And he said in his, in his remote viewing transcript, I'm feeling sick, there's some kind of fumes here. I'm done with this experiment. And then I discovered that it was Mount Hecla in Iceland. He said, why would you send me to such a terrible, dangerous place? Oh, well, that's incredible, but that he could absorb so much of the experience while being there. So not only could he see it, it was also a visceral uh, experience for him. Uh, that's about as out of body as you can get. I mean, Alistair Crowley, in the early 20th century, wrote extensively about out of body experiences and sex on the astral plane. Yes. Now, that's outside of our job description at SRI. Uh but that's part of the trajectory. Were any of Crowley's books in your dad's bookstore when you were growing up? Sure were. <laughs> that's great. How about hypnosis and hypnosis books? Did that become kind of a major fascination for you like ESP did later on? Uh, I, was, I was not involved in hypnosis. Okay. That is, and, and as much as we would like to believe it, uh, hypnosis does not appear to help you with UESP. Because in order to do something like remote viewing, uh, you have to have your analytical sense functioning. That is, uh, if you close your eyes and you see George Washington, uh, you've got to be able to deal with that. Unless you have a friendly interviewer, you've got to deal with that and say, now, now what is, what's the 
I know I'm experiencing George Washington, but what's actually the image here? Right. So you've got to separate the uh, mental noise from the psychic image. And, and that's how you, the trick to learning remote viewing is to separate the psychic signal from the mental noise. And that's what my little ESP game helps you with. Yes. Well, that's an extraordinary tool. And separating the noise from the psychic image really sounds like the crucial first step. That's right. And uh, I do strongly recommend people download the free app you've developed. You know, I've had some very interesting results with it. So. It's called ESP Trainer. Right, ESP Trainer. Uh, Russell, just amazing insights into the work you've done in both of these episodes. Thank you so much. You certainly have expanded my thinking on what is possible on that deep, intuitive level. And so many others have been influenced by your fascinating research for decades. I want to say thank you for your extraordinary efforts to expand our vision of ourselves. And before we go, would you like to tell us what you have coming up? Well, we'll have a film for you at the end of the year, uh, Third Eye Spies. And you can see the rest of what we know about this in my book, The Reality of ESP. And you might send people to my uh, website, which is ESPResearch.com. Yes, that's an excellent site. Uh, Russell, it's great having you on the show. And I really look forward to the documentary. And we'll talk soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me for this fascinating episode on Psychic Breakthrough, Remote Viewing the Future with physicist Russell Targ. You can find more deep interviews, special reports, and documentaries at www.darkjournalist.com. You can also subscribe here to our YouTube channel to get the latest videos. See you soon. Subscribe to our newsletter at darkjournalist.com to stay updated on the latest shows.